always fine with us. Max will have you covered there. You can also watch us on your video streams, which is Facebook, YouTube, and X. Uh, there, you are able to leave your comments for the show, have some fun that way. We love that. It uh, gives us the ability to interact with you. And it, it's a way that, you know, if you're at the office or you can't really call in, that you can get in touch with the show. So you have that uh, opportunity and ability to do that there. Lots of good stuff to come. Again, I'm Jacob Albrecht. It is Sports Daily on a Thursday. Let's start with those Kansas City Royals. I Listen, the longer this goes, and, I, and the streak is nice. Now, eight and four uh, in a division that early in the season has been good. Cleveland to Detroit also playing really well. But as we you know continue to try and just navigate all the little things that are happening that give you long-term hope with the Royals that this could be a year to get excited about, a summer of baseball that we've been lacking for so long here in this area. And, and, it, and we see those little things within this streak. We see Seth Lugo, uh, Lugo spin another one. Great outing yesterday. Uh, effective. You know, was it electric? No, but it was effective. Two runs and in six innings. That's now three great starts for him. Continuing the starting pitching trend that has been there now a third time. We're going a third time through the rotation here. Uh, the bullpen yesterday was not perfect, but but good. Scoreless makes it good, right? You hit three more scoreless innings for the bullpen. That's now eight in the last two games. Scoreless innings for the bullpen. And we're seeing a, you know, a an organizing of things for this team. Now they had a massive lead, right? It was an 11 to two win, but it's still, I think, I think at this point, anytime you get scoreless innings out of the bullpen, you're taking that as a win. So that's a promising sign. And the offense continues to develop and be good. And you're looking for growth and guess who came to the plate and had the big day yesterday. The guy, the last guy really to sort of take off this year of the of the players that we really feel like are going to be key contributors, and that's Vinny Pascantino. Vinny Pascantino with five, five RBI yesterday, three for three, scored a couple of runs, a slump buster, if you will. He said after the game, he, he tries not to look too much into that, but it's just, and, and I get it, guys, we're 12 games into a season. Okay, but remember where we were 12 games into a season last year when it already had felt like hope was lost, that this team was going to do nothing. And think about the difference between that and this. This franchise was very aggressive this offseason. You know, comparatively speaking and relatively speaking, it was as aggressive as it's ever been in this offseason uh, with the Bobby Witt Jr. contract, with the you know free agent starting pitching acquisitions, with the bullpen acquisitions. They went out, they got aggressive, they spent some money, they doubled down on their, you know, on their on their franchise superstar. And we're seeing the fruits of that labor early this year. You know, it could it be nice if it had come a year earlier. I would imagine if you're uh the powers that be trying to convince people that you need a new downtown ballpark, but this will help. And and I'm curious to see how much energy and buzz will surround this franchise as they begin and if they continue to make their way through this winning games. It, it is a roster, and we've said this on this program. It's a roster in that division that absolutely should be able to compete. And right now, it absolutely is. Six wins in a row. Yep, four of them came against the White Sox, but these last two have come against the Astros. And I, I think that that stuff matters as you look at, you know, what this team might do down the road, because if you look at the schedule, it doesn't get very easy. They've, they've got a tough schedule for a while. And the American League is going to be a grind anyway. I mean, you look at the American League and think about, you know, how many teams. There's really two bad teams, we would think, in the American League. And everybody else is pretty good, right? You've got Oakland, who's bad. You've got the White Sox, who are bad. And then all, what is it, 13 other teams are likely going to be competing for a playoff spot, especially if Detroit continues to take its steps forward. And, you know, Cleveland, as it always is, is in the mix. Like you go you go up and down the American League and run differential right now, by the way. The only team that has a better run differential than Kansas City is Cleveland. 
So that's always a good place to look to see like how dominant a team is or or how good a team is. Like, are you lucky? Are you do- no? Their their run differential is high right now. It's higher than the Yankees. It's higher than Baltimore. It's higher than Boston, who's off to a hot start. Uh, it's higher to t- higher than Texas, the defending champs. You look at a team like Detroit, and maybe you know that theirs is at zero. Maybe their seven and four record is a little bit misleading. Only Cleveland is higher in the American League, and re- and and only Cleveland is higher across Major League Baseball. I do think with the Royals, though, we're going to hyper focus on their division. You know, look if they can compete for a wild card, this is going to be a really good year, right? Because I think it's going to take you know mid to high eighties win wise to to get into that wild card mix, and maybe even ninety wins to get into that wild card mix this year, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe there are so many good teams in the American league that it is sort of a battle of attrition, which favors the Royals. But I still look at the division right now. And you just look at roster to roster in the American league central and roster to roster right now. When you consider everything, when you consider rotation, lineup, bullpen defense, you can't sit here honestly today and say there is a better roster than Kansas City right now. And that should give people hope. Oh, and by the way, they're also playing well and winning games, right? So we knew the roster was going to be there. Vegas sort of knew that. They had them up into the 70s and wins. They were, you know, certainly expecting more out of the Royals this year. We certainly expected that based on the moves they made this offseason. Now it's about delivering, which is also something they haven't done in years past. And they are doing it right now, 12 games into the season. Two games into a series with the Astros. They have won the series with the Astros no matter what happens. That's a big deal. And then they got to go on the road for a while. Mets, White Sox. If there's any schedule relief in this early portion of the season, it's going to come right there. But those are, you know, six straight on the road with the Mets and the White Sox. Because after that, it's Baltimore, Toronto, Detroit, Toronto, Texas, Milwaukee. You know, Angels, Seattle, like it's going to be a grind after that. So this next little stretch of games will be very interesting. See if they can keep this going. Of course, you want to see them, you know, finish things off today against Houston. Brady Singer, who's been really good, uh, going up against Hunter Brown, who's not that good for the Astros. You'd like to see him, you know, finish things up there. And then you get on the road. Yeah, they're on the road, but they're, you know, schedule wise, there's six of the games you'd like to win at least half, maybe four of those six games. And we'll just have to see how this thing keeps rolling along. Then they get, you know, then they, then they get some, some back to the tough scheduling. So this is a pretty important part. I think of the early season for them to sort of pile it up here because you don't get very many stretches of games against, you know, teams that you feel like you're better than in the American League this year. And I think we feel like the Royals are better than, certainly the White Sox, probably the Mets. We'll see if they can finish it off. Astros, I'm excited for this game today. I'm excited for day baseball. I want to see Brady Singer get up there and take on that Astros lineup. I want to see if Brady Singer can finally crack through what we've been seeing from him for a long time in his career, which is like sporadic little smaller moments of being really good and then you know, it sort of unravels on him. I love the style that he pitches with. So I've always, you know, kind of found myself being a fan of Brady Singer because he moves quickly. His pace is good. He's kind of demonstrative, which is always fun to watch. So I've enjoyed watching him pitch. It'll be very nice uh, to see if he can keep it going. And, you know, and, and if the bullpen can keep it going. You know, two games, eight innings out of the bullpen the last two games. Not a run allowed. That's pretty good. That's pretty good proposition there. Now, yesterday's was with a big lead, but hey, it's still against the Astros. Nice job to the Royals. Again, you'll hear them uh, this afternoon on KFH, uh, which, by the way, you can also listen to that on the Odyssey app. On your way to work, you want to listen in, even after you park the car, maybe you're in the office, you can't tune in a radio. The Odyssey app, odyssey.com, you can always listen live. Just download the app uh, and search for it. You can also listen to us live. That's how a lot of people watch, listen to us, watch us on our streams. Uh, there's a podcasted version when we finish every day that goes up on the Odyssey app that you can check out. So lots of ways to tune into the show. Tommy will be in in just a little bit. We got to get into this Scott Drew stuff. We're going to have Tim Fitzgerald top of the next hour to help us do it. So let's get things reset here before we take our first break. The hotline is open until 10 o'clock here. 869-1240. Chime in. Royals fans. Uh, K-State fans. What do you think about what we'll talk about next? And that's this Lexington Scott Drew situation. I'm going to reset all of this for you from what's happened yesterday into last night. 
And then now into today, it's been wild. It's kind of been comical and fun to follow, honestly. Uh, but it is impactful for us potentially here. We'll get into all of it as we make our way through. Jacob Albrock here, Max Power Producing. It is Sports Daily. Coming right back on KFH. Sports Daily is on KFH. 
All right, welcome back in, everybody. Sports Daily here on KFH. Jacob Albrock with you on this uh, on this Thursday in what feels like it's been the slowest week of all time. It has been such a slow week. What is going on here? Uh, we got the Masters starting up today, uh, which is great. Did you see that? Uh, did you see that Gary Woodland, the Topeka native, KU grad, had a hole in one on the par three with his recovery, uh, with his. Uh, health issues that was fantastic to see yesterday he is teed off here today uh we'll keep you apprised of what's going on at the masters throughout the throughout the program here certainly we'll talk more about that as our resident golf super fan tommy rejoins the program let's talk about scott drew here now for a few minutes and just sort of get you caught up to yesterday so when we left the air yesterday, basically the reporting has been that Kentucky is interested in Scott Drew. What we still don't have a great grasp of is Scott Drew's interest level. Uh, and I'll just sort of take you through a, a, a sequence of events here. So a plane last night, according to uh, Darby Brown of KWTX, uh, was coming back from Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, Scott Drew was not on the plane, apparently, but a lot of people in his family were. So that's interesting. We knew that there was a plane that went out there. I, I don't know what's going on here with all of this. I, I So yesterday we get that news, and then Scott Drew tweets a picture of himself at a restaurant in Waco with a booster. I, I don't know if that was just normal business or if it was Scott Drew trying to like play games. Be like, look, everybody, I'm still here. So then what, what apparently has happened is you've got like a Kentucky – fan uh, calling that restaurant figuring out what the restaurant is calling it asking to talk to scott drew tracking him down that way you've had the flight trackers happening you've got chip gains of chip and joanna gains the you know the home remodeling you know super celebrities of which by the way they have family ties here uh, to our area i've learned but anyway he's out there trolling kentucky fans on social media which is just an incredible uh, experience to watch too. So you got all that happening and we still don't have any surefire thing yet here this morning that, you know, th the interest is there or whatever. So all of this is going on. What's been reported is that Baylor wants Scott drew. We are still waiting to see how much Scott drew might want. Then we are still waiting to see whether he would, if he if he looks at an offer from Kentucky, give Baylor a chance to counter that offer. Uh, there is, you know, it, it's hard because we don't have exact details to his contract at a private school. But we think, as he was rumored for a Louisville job, that he already used that and his agent used that to get a little leverage there with Baylor. So, th look, this is all very interesting. It's all very uh, fluid. It is taking a just a bit longer than I thought it might. Uh, but if that plane came back from Lexington last night, maybe his family was out there just, you know, scouting the area. I know people in Lexington. I, it seems like it's a great place to live. I've said here before that I don't think he should take that job. I don't think he should take that job because I think the the only way to go for him, his success level now, what he can still achieve at Baylor, quite frankly. Like, I don't think Scott Drew's going to Kentucky and having a much better, if any better, chance to win national championships than he has at Baylor, okay? Now, if he were to take the same formula that's working at Baylor for him, perhaps, uh, but not with, with Coach Cal's formula, which was to get all the most talented freshmen. Now, Scott Drew's one of these coaches that does a nice job of sort of blending it, right? of having experienced players, of being very active in the portal, uh, and and still recruiting at a really high level in the high school world. So he, he like Bill Self, is, has done a nice job, I think, of you know sort of mixing it and blending it all together. Uh, Kelvin Sampson does that really well at Houston. But, you know, Coach Cal was more or less bringing as many talented, the most talented players that you can and try and make it work. So I don't know, A, does Scott Drew's style translate there? But I, I just can't be convinced that he'll have a significantly better chance to win national championships than he does at Baylor. And maybe that's the case. Maybe he does. 
but the level of success that Scott Drew has achieved at Baylor will probably make him a Hall of Fame coach. Uh, you know, resurrecting a program, winning a title, a perennial contender right now there, right? They'll, they'll name an arena after him. He'll have a statue there someday. Versus going to Kentucky, where you're always riding coattails at Kentucky, right? He's never going to be the guy at Kentucky. You know, minus some Nick Saban level of success, which isn't going to happen in college basketball. It's too hard to win the tournament. It'll never be legacy-wise what it was at Baylor. Now, nationally, perhaps, maybe. But then you've got this expectation thing. Coach Cal's level of success has been tremendous at Kentucky. They've had some first-round exits recently. So being really good all year, getting all the best players, but getting bounced early in the NCAA tournament, after you've you know been to all the Final Fours, won a championship, been to the championship game, all of those things is not enough for Kentucky fans because they wanted Cal out. That, to me, if I'm Scott Drew, with my legacy so solidly cemented, just would not be something I would want to chase. Now, there's the money factor, which is first and foremost. If Kentucky's going to double his salary, which they could probably, then, you know, that that's a totally, like, who knows at that point, right? If they're in such a better position in the NIL space, and, and maybe they are, and it just elevates, you can basically go get anybody you want, that's probably got appeal too. But man, when you think about expectations and all of this other stuff, that's tough. The other thing I wonder about, you know, five years ago, let's say, Scott Drew, if he left Baylor, Baylor would have been a huge question mark, right? Like, what's going to happen to this thing that I've built? I never want to see it not be amazing, right? I think that matters. Whereas now, you've got at least two guys out there who Baylor fans would be thrilled to have if you could convince them to jump across the conference and come back there, which might be a stretch. I don't know. And McCaslin and Jerome Tang. You know, do, do, Paul Mills was a part of that tree. Has he been at it long enough at a high enough level to justify there? You know, some of so like I, I, I think it's fair to look at some of that too and think, you know, if there was ever a time to leave Baylor for Scott Drew, if he ever wanted to do that to try something else, now is probably the time for that because you've got several, you know, candidates. And I and I don't know if those conversations, I don't, I don't know if you go down that road. Like I, again, I try to put myself in these situations. If I'm Scott Drew, and, and not like public facing, private facing, what's actually happening? Not what, what not what people know or whatever. If I'm Scott Drew and I was thinking about this, I would probably be having conversations with McCaslin and Tang now to say, look, guys, I'm really thinking about this. What would your interest level in coming back even be? You know, money, everything aside, would that be even something you'd consider? Because I wouldn't want to leave my baby, so to speak, either in the wrong hands. And so there's all these different things. It's why it's such an interesting courtship with, with Scott Drew versus, you know, you go down the list and you look at other candidates for the job and most, most of the candidates, it's just a chance to go coach at one of the best places, one of the best places, one of the top four jobs in the country, one of the top, we'll, we'll call it one of the top five jobs in the country. That that's usually enough with the money and everything and, and the almost guarantee that you'll have higher level players, all that stuff for, for basically to me, everybody, except for, you know, a, a, of the non established blue blood guys already for everybody, basically besides Scott Drew and, and Mark few. And so for those two individuals specifically, I probably wouldn't do it if I were them for everybody else. I mean, of course you do, right? Like that's the pinnacle. That's where you're, that's where you want to be. So it, it is interesting, but if Scott Drew is their guy, and I think he should be this far into the search, probably, I, I think, you know, for me, it would be him or Underwood or Beard. You know, if the, if all the others that have reportedly been of interest have all said no, essentially, those would sort of be the next three guys I would look to if I were Kentucky in what order, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not totally sure on that. I'd probably say Underwood, Drew Beard. I don't know. It's pretty much a wash for, between those three for me. So they're going to go through this process. Scott Drew, as far as a success level, I, I, here's the thing too. Like I've seen a lot of Big Blue Nation 
act like they're not thrilled about the prospects of Scott Drew. And I'm like, you're, you're absolutely insane. If you don't think Scott Drew's good enough to come to, that's another reason I, I would, you know, be hesitant if, if I were Scott Drew is because if you're coming into that and you don't think what you, if, if so much of the fan base and, and you can't live everything by, you know, crazy online fans, but it, it probably is pretty representative of everything. I mean, Scott Drew has had more success than, you know, the John Calipari did coming in from Conference USA at the time with Memphis. And they had gone to, um, they had gone to at least, it was four straight Sweet 16s at that point. They hadn't lost, they'd lost like one conference game. He was killing it at Memphis. And so it was, there was a lot of buzz coming right into it. But if you look at the overall body of work, Scott Drew's got a national championship. He is winning consistently in the best college basketball conference in the country. Like his resume is impeccable. If you're just if you're just stacking resumes solely, you're not going to find a better one among the actual candidates that appear to be viable in this job. So we continue to watch this. Uh, we continue to see what it means because, and, and we'll get into this with Tim Fitzgerald. The the elephant in the room for us here. <sighs> the elephant in the room is that if this if this hits Jerome Tang and if it impacts us there, um, there are all kinds of fake stories out there. Um, people are are acting like this is a done deal. I, I don't know if it's a done deal. I just, I would like to know so we can know how much we need to be panicking with Jerome Tang because they, this has been a tough one to follow. You've got, you know, you've got, it, it's akin to the, the KU media, right? Where you have so many specialist reporters that follow that program and, and you're getting somewhat of mixed signals from that group. It, it's, it's a little bit tricky. It is a little bit tricky to try and follow what's real. You know, the plane with his family coming back, if that's true, and I'm, I'm sure that it is, it came, it's on camera. It came from a, you know, a local reporter there in Waco. There's obviously interest from Scott Drew. It's, it's on a much larger scale, similar to what we saw with Jerome Tang in Arkansas last week. Like, okay, so we know that Arkansas wanted Tang. We know Tang had interest, and we know he gave Kansas State a chance to come back. They did. He stayed. So with Scott Drew, we know Kentucky's interested. We know there's interest from Scott Drew. They're going to make an offer. Does he give Baylor that chance to come back? Can Baylor come back? Right? If he if he goes in and Kentucky offers him $11 million a year, which has been reported out there that they'd be willing to pay, and he makes around five and a half now, right? They're, they're offering to double his salary. And you come back to Baylor and we're like, what can we do? And Baylor's like, look, we can't, I mean, we can't do that. You know, how high, what's the threshold? What's the number? What's, I, I don't know any of that. And can Baylor even do it? I, I'm not sure. But that's going to be what we have to watch here now as we make our way through this. Because again, this is all going to uh, get in and, and come to us very, very, very quickly. All right, let's go to the phone lines, KFH hotline. Anthony on the line. Anthony, what's on your mind? Well, you know, I feel like I'm in a trigonometry class with you breaking all this down and Scott Drew and Kentucky's fascination and how does this affect Kansas State and whatnot. I do have a question, though, because, you know, when you look at uh, Scott Drew and his coaches that have finally branched off, it was longevity that they had on the staff. So the next question would be, if he was to take that, make that leap, is there someone that's currently on his staff that's been around there at least um, in fifteen years? That I mean, you say, you know, no, I don't, I don't know. I that you wouldn't start there. You'd start with the guys that have already been head coaches. Um, now, is there like a third option, a fallback, or even a fourth option if you would even think about Paul Mills in that role? which I don't, I don't think they would be ready to do that yet, but, but perhaps if we're just looking at, you know, the tree itself, I mean, he, he was able to keep a lot of those guys for a long time. So right. my guess is probably not. Um, 
But what you don't have is is the success and the track record of at least Tang and McCasland and the opportunities that they have had. So right. you know right. the the calls are going to start with those two guys if that job becomes open. It, almost right. certainly, almost certainly, because those are two guys that are at the top of most lists anyway for any job across the country, right? right? And, and so and, that's where you have to start if you're Baylor. And and the reason I ask if there's someone on the staff, because I, I remember watching Baylor a few years back when Tang was on the staff, and I think Baylor, I think, I don't know if uh, Drew had, had to serve a suspension or he was out because of some family matters, but he went on record and said, if, I had to take half a season off. I would trust Jerome Tang with my program. And at the time when I heard that, and I think Wichita State might have been in, I think this when the whole Greg Marshall situation started, I was like, uh, maybe I need to get a Baylor call because Scott Drew has someone on his staff that he would trust his program with. And you would think someone that he would trust the program with, you ought to give them a call. But we know how that all played out, so that's why I come out. Yeah, I don't know that. T- I don't. I don't get the impression Tang was would have taken that job. I think Tang had a perfect. It was a perfect storm yeah. for him to leave and right. go to K State. You know, it right. was obviously a high profile job. So, and it was what right. the. It was. I guess but, it was two years after. Right, but that was but that was my reference point because you know. Every coach at some point, they have someone that they could probably trust their program with, but I hadn't heard them mention anybody since Jerome Tang, but that was a ringing endorsement knowing that Baylor was that high of a level of a program. And Scott Drew to say, you know, if I had to take an extended time off, I could trust Jerome Tang with his program, and it would still be clicking at a high level. So I didn't know if he might have had someone in waiting because, you know, that's a big thing too now. You know, coaches in waiting, you look at like a Duke and a North Carolina, Look, if you look at their coaches that they have currently right now, that's pretty much all in house. And I know maybe Baylor might. Model yeah, I, I think I, I, you know, I probably we. I, what the, and the reason I say I don't know is because I don't know, but I, I do think we would have probably heard something. Um, you know, I think we would have heard about that candidate if if it was there. Um, so. I, I, I just, I don't think it, I think it's probably not there, um, but maybe it is, maybe it is, may, but, but they're not going to be better than, than those two guys we were talking about because those two guys can come back and say, Hey, we've, we've been head coaches. Now we're doing this. Right. And here's the other aspect now, and, and I'm not a big analytic guy. I can't stand analytics, especially when it plays a role in sports, but here's the one time where analytics just may play a role and it's called M O N E Y. And you have to realize this Baylor is still in the state of Texas and Texas is a money state. And I wouldn't be surprised if Baylor might be able to match if it comes down to a counter offer. So you have to keep that aspect. So that's one thing where analysts may play a role because yeah. it's and- about the money. So that's all I have for you, and I'll let you unravel all that. And thanks for taking my call, sir. Appreciate it, Anthony. Always, and it's either analytics or it's tax laws. People do need to remember that Texas does not pay a state income tax. You know, so I, I don't know what the state income tax level is, Kentucky, uh, but it'll, it, but it's nothing in Texas. So you know, maybe Kentucky offers eleven, and Baylor can get to eight, and it's a wash. I, I don't know what the, I don't know how much Kentucky pulls. Uh, but that is always a factor to think about when you think about the state of Texas and what it can offer players and coaches and whatever. They don't have to pay income tax on that money state at the state level. Uh, it's like Texas, Washington, and there's a, like two others uh, that don't have to do that. So I appreciate that. I'll get one more comment here on this and then we'll take a break. We'll bring Tommy in. JB says my issue on going to Kentucky for any coaches uh, to be the first year or two. The new coach loses nine games, doesn't get past the round of 32. They'd probably be fired. Why go? Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at two years, nine losses each year and never a trip into the second weekend, I absolutely think they could fire that coach. So it, it is. That's, and that's been the point from the beginning, right? The risk for a couple of these guys. Now, if you're, it depends. It's appropriate risk level for a lot of coaches. Uh, but for coaches that have 
you know, built an empire and done all these things. Maybe it's not. Uh, so we appreciate the comment there, JB. Appreciate the call, Anthony. Let's take a quick break. The Masters is underway. Uh, we've got Tommy back. Tommy, show me. Hey. So what, do you, what do you got, Tommy? Yeah, so uh, first off, I'm glad to be here. Uh, some breaking news that uh, 12 News is reporting. O.J. Simpson has passed away, uh, according what? to reports. Uh, that just came down on the 12 News app. I got breaking news on that uh, literally seconds right. ago. O.J. Simpson has passed away. According to reports, I'm, we'll try to find more info on that during the break and uh, see if we can bring more info. Yep, we'll be checking on that. Uh, we will be getting into the Masters just getting underway. All of this stuff happening. We're going to have Tim Fitzgerald to help us with this, uh, you know, Scott Drew situation there in Baylor. Coming up at the top of the next hour, it's Sports Daily. All broadcasters in now. Max Power producing. Uh, we are coming right back. See you in a second.
commercials are over. Yo, I haven't got all day. 869-1240. Time to get busy. This is Sports Daily on KFH. ESPN Bet is ready to take you through all the huge sports moments this spring. The exclusive sports book of ESPN has it all, including exclusive offers and promotions from Scott Van Pelt and Stephen A. Smith. From the playoff intensity to getting on the links and out to the ballpark, there's no better time to be sports fans. Sign up today and new users get $100 in bonus bets for making any sports book bet. Download ESPN Bet today. What a play. Must be 21 plus. Gambling problem. Call 1 800 Gambler. In partnership with Hollywood Casino at Kansas Speedway, terms and conditions apply. See app for details. Uh, the Masters just getting underway. I'm looking at ESPN Bet right now. Uh, Tommy, I want your take. I'm going to go Colin Morikawa as a winner, 45 to one, and then on a long shot, I'll go Gary Woodland in the ultimate uh, comeback, amazing story at like 350 to one. Uh, for my master's bets. What do you got? Um, I, I will never, and I don't care if it's the masters or any other golf tournament, I will never bet a winner of a golf tournament because the oh, field chicken, the field is so large. It's just, it's not worth it to, in my mind it's to not, bet a it's winner. It's totally not. But what Ch- I will our, our do, pal Chelsea messenger yeah. used to lecture me on that. What I, I will do is I will bet a top 10 or a top 20, um, or even like making the cut. If you really don't want to, you know, get super risky, I'll do that. Uh, but a top a top five, I think, you know, you could maybe look at that. And there are some players that uh, they always show up and play really, really well at Augusta. They're just built, they're built for the course. They are really good at that. Um, I think of a guy like Zach Johnson back, you know, a decade ago or 15 years ago. He wasn't great. I mean, he was a really good golfer, but he didn't really dominate other courses. But he played Augusta really well. Bubba Watson plays Augusta really, really well. Phil Mickelson plays Augusta really well. Um, there are some of those golfers out there that do that. Jordan Spieth was one of them. Um, so I would always look at maybe some of those golfers that historically, even if they're not dominant at the top of their game right now, if they play the golf course really well historically, those would be guys I would look at for a top 10 or a top 20 finish. Tiger is at 80 to one right now. So you're dodging my question. Who's your winner? Uh, if I had to pick a winner, actually, somebody asked me this this morning. Scotty Scheffler is the the best golfer in the game. He's probably the favorite. He's I'm guessing right favorite. now, betting favorite. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, so one. you're yeah, you're not, not gonna get you're bet. not gonna get great odds on that, which is again why I probably wouldn't bet a winner. Um, Scheffler is just, I mean, he's so dominant and so good at what he does. He's won the Masters before. Um, that's the absolute safe bet, but you're not getting much juice. You're not getting much value on that. No, I mean you can't even bet it. You, you, you just to win at four to one is ridiculous. You're not getting. You, yep. you just can't have any fun. But he's my winner. Better. I'm not going to bet it, but he's my winner. Okay, all right. Um, if uh, yeah, that would be it. Would be a dumb question. We'll we'll keep you apprised of the Masters coming back uh, in the next hour. I love Certainly, it. It's they, the best weekend of off, the year. They I'm, teed I'm off so, late this morning. They correct. Did. They yeah. had weather issues, yeah. weather delay, so they're just getting underway now. I don't know what that's going to mean. You know, for the rest of the tournament, I have. Some friends that are going out there, uh, they'll be there on Sunday for the final round. Um, so I don't know how it'll impact that. I'm sure that they'll be able to make time up, um, you know, as the day goes on. You know, maybe it'll have to, you know, round one be suspended and go into tomorrow. That sort of thing happens. Um, but it's, I love it. I'm, if you're watching the video stream, I'm wearing my green Azalea Master shirt that my wife picked out for me today. And I'm proud to wear it because it's the first day of the Masters. Uh, it's like a holiday. It's this March Madness and the Super Bowl for me. It's it's those three events. Opening day of Major League Baseball. You forgot one. I love uh, I love Major I love Opening Day, but the Masters I, it takes the cake for me. I am wearing my Jesse and the Rippers uh, t shirt that was at the top of my t shirt pile in my in my drawer. So that's how I decided what to wear. Um, my wife would not have picked this shirt. I can guarantee you that. Uh, but that's okay. That's all right. It is Masters time. I know this is one of your favorite times of the year. And, and, and look, that's, that's you know, great. people, I, this is um, like, I've got a bunch of things planned for the rest of the weekend into the weekend. We're going to a Masters party tomorrow night that we were invited to. Uh, and then they're not even golfing tomorrow night, are they? Well, no, but I mean, the round will be done and then there'll be a part like a dinner party, you know, after the round oh. is over that we're, we're going okay. to. Uh, and then on Sunday, my wife, Swear to God, she has put together a master's menu. 
So we are having our, our dinner, our family dinner on Sunday evening will be items from the master's concession stand uh, that are like well-known food See, items from kids Augusta. Love golf. Yeah. This is why your kids love golf. You, my kids don't even know what the master's is. Uh, so I, 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 kudos to you guys. That's fantastic. Uh, you brought this up and, and it'll be a hard left turn no matter how we take yep. it. So we'll, we'll get it here because we've got a guest coming Tim Fitzgerald at the top of the next hour. OJ Simpson has in fact died. Uh, multiple outlets reporting age 76 uh, cancer battle he's been dealing with. I'm not certain I even knew that, uh, but I don't, I don't even know. I, we're not going to be the best place to describe the legacy of OJ Simpson. I'll tell you that. Uh, it is one of the strangest uh, that sports has ever known. Certainly uh, one of the most high profile trials and police chases of all time and a weird time in, in, you know, in prison and all of these other things for a guy who is one of the best football players in the world, who was a Hollywood celebrity for a little while. I don't even know where to begin, but the news is there today that OJ Simpson has died at the age of 76. Uh, with a, a a battle with cancer, apparently, that's been happening for him. So, um, when you when you consider everything about you know one one of the more well known, and I don't mean that in a positive way, certainly, but one of the more well known athletes ever, mm -hmm. in OJ Simpson. Yeah, and I think that he was one of the first or one of the the major football players to cross over into pop culture and entertainment, you know, it, it kind of had distinctive careers, you know, had the, the football career, which was incredible. And then he transitioned into movies and TV and all of that. Then he became a pop culture phenom for all the wrong reasons. And that, you know, people that are around our age, that's where we're going to know OJ Simpson. I, like I distinctly remember being a kid and uh, I don't know if I watched the police chase live, but I remember seeing it on the news, you know, when I was a kid. And then the trial was such a huge deal, you know, formative years, right? Like that was all going down when, when we were, gosh, what, probably late elementary school, early middle school, somewhere around there, you and I. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, formative years. And so we, we got our impression of O.J. Simpson for all the wrong reasons uh, at, at the, those formative ages. Um, you know, and then, of course, just drama as his life continued and went to prison for another reason. I mean, it just extremely complicated. Um, you know, the OJ, I think it was OJ Made in America. Was that the documentary series was phenomenal yeah. to watch? Like, And I was, didn't I didn't check it out, it but I, I remember phenomenal. Yeah. And then there was the drama series and Cuba Gooding Jr. played him. Uh, the People versus OJ Simpson. That was phenomenal as well. So, you know all these different things coming back in the last five or six years, um, you know, to kind of recap his life and everything that happened with him. Uh, definitely a complicated figure, a legacy that's extremely muddy and murky. Um, great football player. Definitely. A, it's a strange yeah. way to try to sum up, you know, his life and, and legacy, I guess. I honestly don't know how to do it. I, so I'm not going to pretend know. to do it here. You'll, you'll have opportunities to, you know, see that, all over everything that you consume today so uh, we'll get you that news there and we'll leave that sort of thing to some other people when we come back we will get tim fitzgerald in here uh I, this this baylor thing this scott drew thing has been funny uh the last 24 hours or so it's been really fun to follow but it's about to you know hit fever pitch and and we'll get to the latest there and what it means for jerome tang at k-state that's all coming next hour of sports daily don't go away
1240 KFH. This is Sports Daily with Jacob Albrock and Tommy Kester. All right, welcome back in, everybody. Sports Daily here on KFH. Glad to be with you. Mornings at KFH. The staff enjoys a great cup of coffee from Prairie Fire Coffee. Always appreciate Prairie Fire for keeping us fueled up and ready to go. Reminder, you've got Royals baseball this afternoon against the Astros at 1 o'clock. Max is tracking down Tim Fitzgerald for us on this Baylor situation. Tommy, did you follow the comedy uh, yesterday? Uh, Hang... Hang tight, Tommy. Forget everything I just said, because in the last five seconds, Pat Forty of Sports Illustrated reports this. Breaking news, everybody, according to Pat Forty. He's quoting sources here. Scott Drew has decided to stay at Baylor and will not be the next head coach of Kentucky. Oh, oh my God. Here we go. I think this is hilarious. Here a- we go. It is a slight sense of relief right now to know that the Baylor jobs, if this is true, and Pat Forty has it, so it's not like this is some random, you know, blogger somewhere or, or you know, yokels like us here on the radio, just <laughs> whatever. It's, this is, it's a bona fide college sports reporter. Matt Norlander from CBS Sports is reporting it as well. Breaking Scott Drew okay, has so passed on Kentucky's offer and yep. will remain at Baylor. Yep, so the agents are out now. That's done. Sense of relief. Uh, it's hilarious because Kentucky fans totally deserve this. And as long as they don't, you know, turn their sights to Jerome Tang, right? We're, I think we're in good shape. We'll see. He's not, I, you know, they're, they're going to take a few things early, but everybody keeps turning down that job. And like, because for, for think about the people that have been rumored for it, Tommy, that, you know, Dan Hurley, why would you go to Kentucky? I wouldn't. No way. Uh, Billy Donovan, you really going to leave the NBA to come back and and do all that? No. Uh, Jay Wright, he left Villanova for a reason, right? He doesn't want to do this in this world anymore. Okay, so if those are the guys, now you get down to Scott Drew, and for the reasons I'm, I, I like, I really like, I don't know why he would have taken that job. I, I just there was too much to lose. How many other guys do you think are going to feel that way? Like, how far down the list do you have to go to make it worth it for somebody to come deal with all that? I mean, you're telling, and and what's so strange about it, Tommy, is they didn't fire John Calipari. He left. He was sick of it, right? So it's it's hard to know. Like, for the administration itself, Calipari was doing a good enough job, but he'd still had enough. Like, I can't, I I I just can't imagine walking into that. And and at some point, again, they're going to get further down their list, and they'll be like, well, yeah, I would take Kentucky for sure. I just wonder, like now. Those are all the names that were shoe in candidates. That's that's all of them. And they've all said no. So now what do you do, Kentucky? Yeah, I, I don't know. And and this is it's hilarious. I, I'm I'm having a hard time containing my laughter uh, right now with this entire situation. I think we do have Tim Fitzgerald on the line from GoPowerCat.com. Uh, Tim, man, I, I don't I don't know if you have seen this. Uh, Scott Drew staying at Baylor, not going to Kentucky. Um, 
th this this is just it's crazy this whole thing is just nuts yeah um and in fact that's what i was working on i lost track of time because i raced down to the studio to record something real quick for a big 12 channel but what a what a huge victory for baylor and the big 12 i mean <clears throat> to keep a top-notch coach like this second time in a you know number of days less than a week that a big 12 coach has turned down a really good job in the sec or you know turned away from it uh, i think it's uh it's a great day for the big 12. it's a great day for college basketball a terrible day for <clears throat> kentucky um you ran cal out of town which is, is the reason i thought it would have been crazy for drew to go you know money notwithstanding like why would he, I, I did, my problem with it was I just don't, I don't think he'd have a much better chance to win titles at Kentucky than he currently does at Baylor with what he's built. So they're going to get to a part of the list now, I think, where the, it, it, it's more about now who do they want. I, I highly doubt that anybody else would tell them no. Um, but what what how far down the list? Of, so we're obviously relieved for Jerome Tang up there at K-State right now that Baylor didn't come open. But I wonder on Kentucky's list where Jerome Tang would sit. And it's probably down their ways, but if everybody keeps saying no, like, are we totally out of the woods here, do you think? Or is there still a slight level of concern that they may come knocking on the door? Uh, now, I mean, I, I'm not sure what Kentucky's going to do, but <clears throat> I can tell you this, that the fans weren't really satisfied with Scott Drew as a choice. That was beneath them. They, they've got to have flash over substance, apparently, and so they, they better go find some flash to make that fan base happy. Um, but, yeah, Scott Drew turning them down. When this was really his dream job, the job he always coveted growing up in Indiana. So it's it's a pretty cool storyline, and I'm really happy for Baylor. I mean, Baylor basketball isn't where Scott Drew works. It's, it's him. I mean, he, he literally raised it from – on the edge of death and, and got it to where it is and won a national championship. I, I can't see him anywhere else. And uh, I don't know what Kentucky's going to do now, but I don't think it'll involve a big 12 coach unless they want to offer bill self like 30 million a year or something. I, I don't even think that would get him out of Lawrence. How do you think things have felt around the Kansas state community uh, for really the last couple of weeks when everything was percolating with Arkansas and then the speculation of Scott Drew at Baylor going to Kentucky potentially and what that might mean for Jerome Tang at Baylor. What, what's been your sense as far as just the overall feeling and atmosphere around Manhattan? Well, I think people were, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot more anxious about the Arkansas opening. Um, it, it really, from our, our point of view, it, it seemed like uh, if Scott Drew did go, which was a big if, that Grant McCasland was the number one choice and, and maybe Bryce Drew was the number two choice. Uh, so there was some insulation there that <clears throat> I, I think made K-Staters feel better, uh, but nobody around here would have blamed Jerome Tang for going back to Baylor if that had come open. Uh, that, that's really the job everyone expected. If it came open, might be where he'd go, um, but now it's not going to come open. <clears throat> and I didn't think it would come open, but then Kentucky comes along and that's a pretty hard thing to say no to if you're Scott Drew. We good with do, do we have any details, Tim, on what Tang secured in the in the leverage against Arkansas from K State? Any amount? Or, you, you know, wh where did they land? Do we know yet on his? Has he got a little bit right? That that's I, I think yeah. I just don't think it's been reported yet the amount. Yeah, I think there was a million dollars uh, added the salaries meaning he could divide it up however he saw fit Got it. Um, between coaches and, you know, maybe there's, there's like a coach's fund and maybe an IL. Um, <clears throat> you know, there, there was some insulation put in, this was in the process of being done, but I think he, he got it locked down, uh, you know, where uh, the decision-making will be uh, less in the hands of the president than it was in the, the past. Uh, there's now a process through which the university goes through to remove a student athlete from a roster. Um, so uh, I think that made him feel better. But at the end of the day, he just really likes it here. And he didn't want to leave. Uh, so he's now working to get on the same page as his university president uh, so that it's a better work environment and try to work past this. Because he's a, he's a really good man. I mean, he wants to move on. It's been hard to move on. 
uh, especially when it keeps popping up for, you know, various reasons, whether it's the president bringing it up or, you know, just the job hunt, uh, all the coaching stuff brings it up because it is a part of this story. And I think, uh, I think Jerome Tang, now that Baylor's locked down, is probably here at K-State for a while. So as far as the transfer portal and everything that has taken place over the last week or two, you know, we know that the the much heralded Michigan transfer, um, you know, is going to Kansas State and all of that. It, is this something as these the coaching cycle continues and, and everything with um, the Kentucky job and, and Jerome Tang being rumored for Arkansas and all of this, it, from – what Jerome Tang has to do on a day-by-day basis and working the transfer portal and building a roster, how much of an impact does the coaching cycle and, and the carousel and all of the drama and rumors and everything play into what he's doing as far as building a roster? Or is he insulated from that and it's basically external noise <clears throat> from media and the fan base and that sort of thing? Um, well, I mean, the, the players follow it that are in the portal. And the coaches that are recruiting against Kansas State follow it. So it has been thrown back at him that, you know, he's not going to be here long. He's probably not going to be here next season. All those things have been said. Um, you know, my thought is don't complain about it when it was true. I, you know, I don't don't complain about the outside, outside noise and people linking you to the Arkansas job when you were involved with Arkansas. Uh, it's What's difficult is when, my coach has it used against him when he really wasn't even looking at that school. Uh, but uh, I, I think they've just been grinding forward. And I think we're going to see some action here in the next week or two uh, with more additions to the transfer portal. Uh, I do seem to think that kids are being a little more uh, finicky, a little more patient in the portal this year than they have in the past. Um, so K-State's having to work through some process. But uh, I know this. They have the NIL money to compete at the highest level, and we'll see if they can find the guys in the portal that get in there. There, there are some guys that just entered. Mitchell uh, leaving Duke. I don't know if K State's a high profile enough, but man, he's from Kansas City, Kansas, and I'm not sure KU has a fit for him. Are they in the you know Are they in the stratosphere of those highest level recruits that are coming out? There's there's some massive high level recruits that are still out there in the transfer portal. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're capable of uh, competing at that highest level. Um, but you know, they're like every coach has to deal with no matter how much money you have in your NIL fund. Um, it, it's like a salary cap. You've only got so much you can put out there. And uh, so you have to figure out how to navigate it. Is, is that post player worth a, a half million, uh, maybe even more than that. Uh, probably more than that. I think Hunter Dixon, Dickinson is worth about a million. Um, and, you know, that's a significant cut in your budget. Does that mean you can't afford the kind of depth you need? Uh, it's it's interesting what coaches are trying to have to navigate now uh, because this was non-existent just a few years ago, but now they literally have a salary cap, an internal salary cap on what they can uh, dish out, divide up and, and via the NIL. It's crazy. Well, not to move away from men's basketball, but major news on the women's front for Kansas State. Aoka Lee returning uh, for next season for the women's team and, you know, arguably one of the best players to ever play for Kansas State women's basketball will make a return. What's the big takeaway from you, the p- big reason why she's coming back and what kind of impact? Um, is? It, obviously, she's a great player, so large impact that she'll have uh, on this program for next season. Well, speaking of NIL, it- it impacts more than football and yeah. men's basketball. I mean, um, women's NIL can compete with the WNBA salaries because they're not nearly as high as the men's. Um, and volleyball, it has a huge impact too. So getting her back um, probably doesn't mean she's going to lose much money for not going to the WNBA. Uh, but also, I think Yoka wants to have a clean senior season. And she was injured all of last year. She was injured right in the heart of this season and never was quite the same. I think she's determined to get that season under her belt and finish it up. Guys, she was recruited at K-State and came here in 2018. Um, that feels like a lifetime ago. Mm-hmm. And yet here she is. She's going to be on the court for her seventh season because she gets that COVID bonus year and she's had two injury years. Uh, so it's uh, it's been a long road. And, and if she gets injured again, you wonder if, she really is going to be able to even play at the, the next level 
uh, because you know so many young women, uh, their knees just don't hold up, to, in, particularly in basketball. They're just not built quite right. The construction of the knees is a little bit different. They give out a lot of knee surgeries in women's basketball. So hopefully she can get past that. Well, I mean, if she does, they got a lot coming back and an explosion of that sport this year fits like K state was, you know, if you, if you could have given them a full clean bill of health all the way through, we saw that team beat Iowa. I mean, they could, they could take another step forward. Don't you think? And, and be even better, Mm -hmm. like a, a top, you know, 10 team for sure next year, if they get the right health. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you know, put it together and find, you know, this year probably gave coach Jeff Mitty a, a great, you know, way to look at his team and figure out, okay, this is what we need. This is what we lacked. And the transfer yeah. portal is open for them too. And there's a lot of female talent in the portal. So um, I don't know what his NIL budget is. And I'm sure Lee takes a big chunk of it, uh, but they can get in there and compete a little bit in the portal to bring in some more pieces to maybe get them to the next level. Fitz, uh, anything else? I, I got to just like, I'm still stunned by them. I'm just trying to catch up on this Scott Drew thing. Uh, yeah. You, you mentioned for the big 12 and I agree. It's just, it's a big deal for him to stay. It's a big deal for Tang to stay. We haven't seen that movement. I don't know how much movement we're going to see out of this league anymore, right? Like it, it is, mm-hmm. I, I think everybody can see the writing on the wall here. And I do think it's a tip of the cap to some degree, at least to the big 12 that Scott drew stayed. And, and oh, that, I, that would be one of you know a thousand reasons, but it is something that I think you hang your hat on a little bit in this part of the country. Well, I think we've seen an expression now uh, by a couple of big 12 coaches Jerome Tang and Scott Drew, that um, those are really good SEC jobs they they decided not to, you know, go through the final process with. Those are nice jobs, but they want to be in the Big 12 where you play the best every week. Um, there's no down days. There's no Vanderbilt uh, sitting on your schedule. Everyone is capable of beating you, and uh, I think there's something to be said for coaches wanting to be at the top of their profession. And they feel like the big 12 is the place to be. All right, Fitz, you said you went down and recorded something. What do you guys have at gopowercat.com with all this literally falling into our lap before we, just before we came yeah. on the air for this segment? Well, we, we've got a podcast up. Some of it's a little dated now, but we knew that would happen. Um, and uh, I will be hosting our big 12 insider show today. My regular host, Brian Hanley is, out of town for the next two days. So we're going to actually talk K-State on that show because uh, we're two months into doing that show. And we haven't talked about K-State, and this seems like a pretty good time. Uh, we did a Baylor uh, to show last night, you know, kind of on the fly. And uh, so we're continuing to grow that channel, but we got a lot of stuff going at Go Pyrocat, including for our subscribers only, a VIP recruiting podcast that will drop uh, late tonight, early tomorrow morning uh, for our subscribers to enjoy Cole Carmody and Ryan Wallace basically get into the weeds with K-State recruiting, but that's behind our paywall. At Life of Fitz on social media, go powercat.com. You can check it all out. Fitz, we appreciate it. Thank you, boys. Great to talk to you. Man, what a what a perfect timing moment there. We'll, we're going to digest it a little bit and see if we can't track down a little bit more of the details on uh, on Scott Drew's uh, you know rejection of Kentucky. Chip Gaines is celebrating well <laughs> somewhere right now. Uh, what what a 24 hours it's been on that job search. And, you know, hopefully now that job search can move on and it'll just leave us alone. The entire coaching cycle could just leave us alone. That would be great. But uh, we'll, we'll dig in a little bit here during the break, see what the latest is. We'll come back more on uh, everything settling in here. Scott Drew's not taking that job. Kentucky will continue their search. Certainly a sigh of relief for K-State fans today. Uh, We'll come back. More Sports Daily. It's all Brockton Caster right after this.
This is Sports Daily on KFH. All right, welcome back, everybody. So the news here of the hour for us is that Scott Drew uh, is not going to be going, going to be going to Kentucky. He is choosing to stay at Baylor rather than uh, rather than, you know, take that job. What's, what's interesting now is I'm seeing, you know, some of the Kentucky folks now saying, well, you know, Kentucky never actually offered him the job. They were just asking him to consider, you know, whether he would be interested in the job. I mean, come on now, Kentucky fans, you're just going to have to eat this one. Okay. You, you guys ran Cal out of town. And now you've been rejected about four or five times. You're just gonna have to you're gonna have to eat that a little bit. Careful what you wish for. We say it all the time. Be careful what you wish for when you're when you're calling for the head of somebody who succeeded at a very high level. We go through this all the time in sports. All the time. Texas, careful what you wish for if you're gonna run Mac Brown out of town, right? Like this happens all the time and it's a cautionary tale of, you know, especially with the NCAA tournament. I mean, come on now. Yeah. Dan Hurley just won two in a row. It had been 17 years since anybody had done that. It's not, it, it's not even logical to hold, you know, tournament success as the ultimate thing 
for the coach of your program in basketball. It is a wild and crazy crapshoot tournament every single year. We've we've now like we can't even count on you know ones beating 16s anymore because we've seen that happen twice. So now Kentucky fans, oh, you know, uh, you know, they, they didn't really offer Scott Drew the job. They they're only they only wanted to know if he'd be interested. That's the narrative now being spun there in Lexington. Okay. Fine. You like how whatever helps you sleep at night, but you're never what you think you are. Never. And you got to be careful what you wish for. You want a new coach? You want to run Cal out? Okay. My first question is always, who's going to replace him? And the thought among fans is always, well, whoever we want, right? Like we'll go get, (laughs) we'll go get Billy Donovan. You know, we'll go get Dan Hurley. Why would Dan Hurley stay at UConn when he could come to Kentucky? Why would Scott Drew stay at Baylor when he could come to Kentucky? Why wouldn't Billy Donovan come back to Kentucky? Yeah, Jay Wright's retired, but that was from Villanova. He'll come back for Kentucky. Nope, 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 nope. They won't. And so now you get to go further down the list, and this is what you wished for, and I think there are plenty of guys who would have a tremendous amount of success at Kentucky. I think there are plenty of guys who could elevate the program uh, to more postseason success than John Calipari did. But I think there are even more circumstances and scenarios where that doesn't happen. And you're kind of screwed. And you're going to watch Calipari win a ton of games at Arkansas with some of the best players in the world who are NBA talent players. Because that's what he does and that's what he'll continue to do no matter where he is. So good luck. Has John Calipari officially signed the contract at Arkansas yet? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's done deal. Because if it wasn't a done deal, I mean, maybe John Calipari could replace Just John ask him Calipari. to come back. Just, yeah. You know, we'll... we'll give you more money than you'll ever need forever. We're sorry. We're sorry. We made a mistake. Please come back. Um, But that's what's so funny is the administration didn't even do anything. He left. Well, but he didn't, he didn't have a great relationship with the athletic director. It had gotten frosty, you know, over the years and that sort of thing. But I don't know. I, as you know, but I was a huge advocate for Scott drew to go to Baylor. He was, he was my choice to, to take that job. I thought he should take the job. I thought it would be great for him. I was on board with all of that. But now that he hasn't, this thing gets weird. Like it could get really weird as far as who they go after because now you're looking at names potentially like Richard Patino or Rick Patino. Like it could be one or the other. Uh, you're looking at, and this wouldn't be a weird choice necessarily, but a guy like Mark Pope at BYU who has a ton of connections at Kentucky, but it's yeah. not a prominent, I don't think a prominent enough like name as a big time college coach to satisfy the fan base, even though he's a Kentucky guy. I think that's going to be an issue, but he's going to be you know, on the radar for sure. Uh, Brad Underwood, I know you brought him up before. That is a name potentially. Like there are, I've heard Shaka Smart could be somebody that could, could you know, Kentucky could pursue. Uh, but I think he's a better fit at Marquette. He didn't do great at Texas when he was kind of in the limelight. So I, I, I don't, don't think, think that's a good either. choice. But it, this could get, this could get strange here pretty quickly. Now that the top guys, not only the aspirational choices, but even some of the top realistic choices are turning Kentucky down. Yeah, I I think it's going to be, if I had to guess now, and again, this would have been my guess from the beginning because I didn't think Scott Drew was going to take it, would be Chris Beard would be my guess as who the next coach at Kentucky is. And I think that would be an excellent hire for Kentucky, just, oh, by the way. Um, I think Underwood is probably a real possibility. Now, that's only based on logic and based on absolutely nothing else i haven't talked to anybody about anything i have no idea i'm just trying to look at it and think like who could you get people excited about or at least some people because if if some people aren't excited about scott drew they're not gonna be excited about anybody you bring in but you know who who would be like yeah that's that's a good get and i think i think beard and underwood stand out the most now you might get with pope some of the fans excited I don't know enough about him because the Big 12s only only had BYU for a year here. So I, you know, I we're we're very familiar with a lot of these guys. I'm not p- familiar with Pope, but I'll tell you this: BYU was better in year one in the Big 12 than I thought they would be. So maybe, and the thing for Kentucky is Kentucky doesn't need to be worried about the popular hire. It's not like Kentucky's going to make an unpopular hire and fans aren't going to show up. That's not going to happen, right? So. If you're Kentucky, the most important thing is that you get it right, not appease the fans. 
So now if, if it's not a more obvious candidate, they're going to have to get pretty exhaustive and decide what do we want here? So, you know, I, I think when you do that, there's a there's a million different directions they could go, right? Kentucky feels like the kind of job that doesn't need to just go cookie cutter in, you know, a, a, na- a list of names that are out there because you have all these search firms, right? And so you always see the same list of names and all these things. And this is Kentucky. You're always going to be able to go to your list of names. How about you go and find the coach that you think could elevate, you know, to a new stratosphere? Like, if I'm Kentucky, I'm going to look for a young, you know, fresh, eager, like who is all in on the new era of college basketball? Who is thriving in the portal right now? Who are some of the best in-game coaches that there are right now. They would have to at least call Kelvin Sampson, who I think would say no, because I think an in-game coach outside of Dan Hurley, clearly now there isn't a better one. So I think you make that call. Um, even though he's older, he would he would immediately, you know, give them chances to win national championships. But then you know, I think you do go down. I think and Chris Beard's an up and cover. Chris Beard has always made the most sense to me outside of that situation at Texas that I don't even fully grasp and understand where that landed and ended, but I think it'd be fine for Kentucky to hire him. Underwood, I think is just a really dang good coach. Um, I mean, that's where guys like Jerome Tang, I think enter the, enter the stratosphere of at least consideration. I don't think Kentucky Tommy has to go and only consider like, who's the biggest name that the fans are going to like, but they, they more importantly, just, Go find the best coach. Like who can? They're not in any danger of you know losing boosters or fans or money or any of that stuff. Like they're going to be fine if they swing and miss. So swing big. Yeah, and I think that that's that's the big question mark. Is when you say swing big, swing big in what capacity? Swing big with a big name because if that's the case, no, then that, maybe, but not. But that doesn't need to be the criteria. If that's the case. The, the names that are left, I mean, Rick Pitino is the biggest name that's left on no, the no, list, no. right? I'm sorry. I mean, let me let me rephrase it. When I say swing big, I mean like swing big and try to hit a home run without like whoever you think the best is. Maybe it's Pope. You know, maybe it's Richard Pitino. But uh, remember the scenario that was laid out yesterday, uh, and it was Pete Thamel from ESPN that said if this drags on long enough, there could then be – a potential path for Billy Donovan to consider. Now he's basically said he's committed to the NBA, blah, 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 blah. They're in the playing tournament. The bulls are once they're, they're out of that. Then at that point, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe there's a, you know, different kind of consideration there for, for Donovan. Um, Man, but maybe not. I, I, just, I, you know, I, I just, I don't know if that's something that you want to bank on if you're Kentucky. I mean, that does, you're talking still like over a week away before you can even potentially have a conversation with the guy. Unless Billy Donovan's NBA job or future is in question or jeopardy, right? Like, I I just cannot imagine a scenario where any NBA coach would want to come deal with the year-long effort it is now of college basketball. It just doesn't seem appealing at all to me. Um, But, I mean, I suppose there's a chance. But, you know, why not call Tommy Lloyd? Right. Like if it, look at what he's done in a short time at Arizona, maybe loves Arizona and he's in a similar spot. They're going to the big 12. I wouldn't leave if I was Tommy Lloyd uh, is, is Kentucky a better job than Arizona? I feel like it's probably a wash, but I, I don't know what they're going to do. I just this careful what you wish for. If you got a great coach and you're trying to run them out of town, just know this, like it doesn't always go the way you think it will. And it's not going to go the way of Scott drew there. Um, for Kentucky. Uh, This portion of the program is brought to you by Crestview Country Club, by the way. Tommy, Masters, Crestview. Yeah. Uh, I've seen and gotten emails of, of, of just, I can't even count the number of Masters things going on at Crestview right now. Events or something. You know, and I, it's funny thinking about a, a, a country club is definitely not anything I would have ever imagined myself doing as, you know, a, a farm kid from the Texas Panhandle. But it's been what's been so, you know, rewarding for our family is all the all the family event type stuff and the kids stuff like we're 
you know, we're, we're on swim teams and we do all that kind of stuff. That's been the fun part. And the master stuff is a good example. Like just emails, like, here's what we're doing. We've got this, 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 all these masters themed events out there, uh, which I'm sure you'll partake in some of it. Yeah. I know they're doing a, uh, master's dinner. Um, I think tomorrow maybe that is every time a, a person wins the masters each year, if you, if you weren't aware the next year, the winner gets to pick the menu for the champions dinner for all the past champions. So last year, John Rom won the Masters. So this year, and it, I think it was, it would have been Tuesday night, they did the Champions Dinner, and John Rom got to set the menu. He's from Spain, so there were a lot of Spanish themed dishes at this Champions Dinner that only winners of the Masters got to partake in. And Crestview Country Club, they're doing their own version of that inspired dishes based on John Rom. So it's a Spanish theme type thing. So they've got that going on. I know they're doing an actual Masters inspired golf tournament this weekend. So you're right. They, there are a lot of different events that are are out there surrounding this Masters event this weekend. But then, like you mentioned, throughout the entire year. Uh, can we, I, I know the masters loves all of its traditions and stuff, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to go to like the, the leaderboard here and they, they have it designed where it's like the actual golf leaderboard, which is cheeky, but it's kind of hard to keep up with, uh, Bryson DeChambeau right now, one under par, uh, with Danny Willett. Keep an eye. Remember Danny Willett? He's I, got a green jacket. He's had a minute. He got yeah. a green jacket. He's 2016, he's, he's a, I think was when that happened. So yeah, he, he's fired a birdie there. And then uh, a couple of guys I haven't heard of Eric Van Ruyen. Oh, uh, Eric Van uh, Ruyen. He's South African Royen of South Africa. The one thing that Taylor I know about Moore him is he, American. he rocks uh stylish pants on the golf course. Like they are very tight around his ankles. They're like joggers. Ooh. They're like capris basically is what uh, this Yoggers. guy rocks out on the golf course. Joggers. Yeah. If you're South African. Yes. Uh, where, where are you on the, on the jogger thing? Cause like, my wife would like for me to wear those all the time. And I'm like, I, I don't know that that's a great look for me. Um, it, it's not a great look for me. I mean, my, my thighs are too fat, you know, to be able to make that work. And I think, yeah, I think I good. have the exact opposite. Like, I don't think it's good for chicken legs either. Yeah. And, and you so, have to be, you have to have a certain kind of stature. Let's just say that to be able to pull yeah. that off. Yeah, we don't pull it off. Maybe if you did, if you Taylor, never right. missed a leg day in the gym, at that point you'd probably be okay with wearing joggers. Yeah, Max, Max would be. A, Max is a, a, a jogger. jogger. Yeah, in fact, yeah. he's. I'm yeah. looking. He's wearing them right now. I'm looking at him. So yeah, they, they couldn't. They couldn't be any tighter. Keep up with, keep up with the style. So we have Gary Woodland of local interest, Tommy. Um, any other local interest we need to be watching here this week? Well, Adam Hadwin um, is in the tournament. Of course, he yeah. lives here. Uh, he and his family yeah. live here in Wichita part of the year. Um, but Gary Woodland, he you mentioned off at 124. Adam Hadwin does. Woodland is already teed off. You mentioned Woodland. Uh, he had a hole in one yesterday at the par three contest, which is always a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. They bring the kids out yep. and they get to participate in that. And so that was really cool to watch. And uh, ESPN, I don't know if you saw this, Jacob. ESPN had an incredible story on Gary Woodland's road to recovery. He had that brain lesion last year and had surgery and thought he would never play golf again, thought he might lose his life, had to have brain surgery. He's back on the golf course. He's competing well. He's in the Masters, you know, again. And, and so if you haven't had a chance to see that, I know it's floating around social media. Uh, check out that Gary Woodland story. It's really well done. Yeah, I was on this morning when we've been on, so I haven't, I haven't tuned into it that it is it's so funny we are so <clears throat> inside baseball here so the masters very very restrictive uh from a tv perspective and what we can show sort of like the ncaa basketball tournament there are strict limits it's very 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 strict so usually we're like we're just guys we're, we're just we don't need to show the video we can show a leaderboard we can talk about it and there's like one circumstance for us now that that oh, there are two that would that would cause us you know, and probably make us, I suppose, three uh, at the top of that list is Gary Woodland. And so yesterday fires that hole in one. And we're like, well, throw out that out the window. We got to figure out a way to get Woodland in here. Uh, the other would be Tiger Woods, certainly uh, because of his appeal to literally everybody on the planet. And then, yeah, Adam Hadwin, we would need to, we would need to get into. And the thing with Woodland is today he's playing with Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, so there is a decent chance you could see a little of his round. Uh, as I would imagine in the early portions, DeShambo is going to get a lot of the coverage. Um, so we'll we'll keep we'll keep our eye on it here today and tomorrow. There ain't anything that's going to happen at the Masters that Tommy didn't know about. Um, he can tell you the stylistic uh, choices of pants from South African players that most <laughs> of us have never heard of. So 
Uh, we've got our resident master's expert here. By the way, uh, just real quick mention, Jeff Goodman uh, saying on his podcast here that while he'd, he'd heard from people close to Billy Donovan a few days ago, there was about a 0% chance he'd be interested in a return to college. He upped that to 25 to 30%. So maybe there is something Interesting. to Kentucky waiting. At this point, why not? I mean, I guess you're somewhat worried about the portal and moving too slowly. But as you know, as Kevin Saul pointed out yesterday, like the portal process is a lot slower than people think. Tim Fitzgerald just mentioned that too. Like the, the window to enter is still going to go on for another few weeks. I think they would be fine to wait. If there's any chance they get Billy Donovan at this point, you, you got to wait. I don't know if he's the best fit. I don't know that he'd thrive in this world of college basketball, but boy, you take a chance on that if you're Kentucky for sure. So we'll keep our eye on that. Uh, more Sports Daily coming up. Uh, we'll get back to the Royals a little bit as, uh, in a little bit of a pregame. They start in just a little more than two hours right here on KFH. So we'll hit that next. I get Tommy's thoughts on the game last night. We opened with it, but we'll return to it, Royals fans, 869-1240. You can get in touch with the program. You can also leave us your comments on our video streams, Facebook, YouTube, X, we've got it all for you. Sports Daily coming right back.
you gotta hear this. Go ahead. I think I want to hear this. Sports Daily is on KFH. All right, welcome back in, everybody. Sports Daily here on KFH. Glad to be with you on this Thursday, this Masters Thursday, this breaking news Thursday on a couple of different fronts. Scott Drew is staying at Baylor. Uh, We have O.J. Simpson uh, died at the age of 76 after a cancer battle. Uh, So those things happening uh, as we make our way through. Tommy, as we look at things, and the Royals. We we open with the Royals here today. Six in a row now, two against the Astros. Another uh, really, really nice and solid start against uh, against Houston from Seth Lugo last night. Another nice performance from the bullpen in a you know in a mop up situation too, which can get a little dicey for bullpens. But that's eight straight scoreless innings for this Kansas City bullpen. And when you look around, the only team in baseball with better run differential right now than the Royals are the Cleveland Guardians. So. That usually is a good indicator of how good a team is. Now, it's obviously way too early, but it none of this is fluky when you look at the Royals. And in fact, they should be at least a game, if not two games better than their record would indicate, uh, if they don't you know, blow some, some late-inning leads and those kinds of things. Vinny Pascantino, the guy we've been waiting on, Tommy, is the guy last night, 5 RBI. He finally has his slump buster. I, I think this is real. Like, I don't think we're, I don't, I don't think it's overhype. I don't think anything else. I think we're seeing enough now over two and a half weeks that th- this is, this is the real deal. Like they they are really going to probably be in the mix here for most of this season. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. injuries aside, the train is rolling. Um, and, and of course it's baseball. So streaks happen all the time. Um, but it's, it's been good to see. The six games, and then you know this was decisive last night against the Astros. Of course, they threw out a a kid that you know was making his big league debut. Yeah, they and have, so they have some pitching problems, yeah, right? for sure. So and so you have to kind of take that into consideration. And you mentioned the bullpen; that's great, and I'm happy. It was a low leverage situation. Uh, that's okay because I think that in you know as the way that this bullpen has struggled early on in the season, it's okay to have some low leverage situations to get your confidence up and, you know, have these guys get experience. Maybe when it's not a tie ball game or a one run game in the ninth or whatever, you, you give them an opportunity to get some reps and get some innings pitched under their belt when it is more mop up duty. Seth Lugo pitched well. Uh, and it was just a, another solid start from a Kansas city, uh, starting pitcher. And that's great. Uh, you mentioned Vinny Pascantino, he brings so much energy when he is uh, playing well, when he's hitting the ball well. And then you add on the energy of Salvi and you add on the energy of Bobby Witt Jr. and all of that. It, it seems like this this is building and it's continuing to, to be built. And I think, I, I know that I was optimistic that the Royals would be improved this year. I didn't really see a six-game winning streak basically to start off the season and them you know, and you mentioned there's at least one or two games that should have been in the win column, and they could be significantly better than what they are right now. I didn't think it would be this good to start off the season. Um, obviously, want to see that continue. Yeah, I mean, this good is right. We we expected them to be Thought better. Be Vegas improved. expected them to be better. There's like those things were expected. This is this is a next level situation. So Houston's dealing. It's advantageous that they're getting Houston when they're getting Houston because they've got some some pitching injuries to deal with, and they're facing Hunter Brown, who isn't that good uh, today, so a good opportunity for Brady Singer in this day game. Then it, we've talked about the schedule and how difficult it's going to be, not just for them, really for any American League team this year. But up next, Tommy, are six games against the Mets and the White Sox. Granted, those all come on the road, so that's tough. But it's six games against the Mets and the White Sox. There's a real chance here for the Royals to capture like the perfect amount of momentum that they currently obviously have in a win streak to the schedule, which is difficult almost all the way through the year, except for like right over the next week for them to continue this and take advantage. And, you know, they have not been one of the many teams across baseball dealing with significant injury news early in the year. You are getting some, like, this is the, they they need to take advantage of this. And 
you know, I do think this is a more important stretch of games than maybe we'll see later in the year in just a couple, because there is an opportunity for them now to capture this lightning in a bottle. And I think that's important to the fans. I think it's important to the energy in the clubhouse. I think it's important to the confidence of young players. And I think it's important to what ultimately looks like it could be a playoff race to get these wins now. Because if you can't get these, you're going to regret it later in the year. Just keep this momentum going and take it through. I do think there is a, a decent amount of spotlight on the next week or so for Kansas City. Not just because of the win streak, but because this is a chance to pile up some wins here. It really is. And it, it's such a different scenario than what we've become accustomed to with the Royals. It seems like it's been a foregone conclusion that this team, year in and year out, ever since the World Series win, kind of stumbles out of the gate. And then by the time they start to get it together, they're so far out of any kind of playoff race that it, they're irrelevant and nobody really cares about them. I mean, it was the end of this month last year that you and I were having conversations about, do we even really care anymore? Like, is this even something that we care about talking about or discussing or investing in or paying any attention to at the end of April, the end of April, we were having that conversation a I year know. ago. Um, and so this is a different and refreshing change. And it takes me back to the world series runs. It takes me back to when you kind of, it, it almost felt then like the Royals were catching lightning in a bottle a little bit. And you, I feel similar to that now. And I think I'll always feel that way when the Royals have success because they're small market and because you're not usually going to see a level of consistency over a long period of time like we see with other teams. So when it does happen, it does kind of feel like catching lightning in a bottle. It is still extremely early, but you're right. These are games that not only do they need to win, they're games that in years past they haven't won. And now that they're doing it, it does... It does continue that relevance, and hopefully for a long time it does. It's flipped upside down, too, because then it was like the strength of the bullpen and the rotation was lacking. It's the opposite right. now. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's good. Again, you'll hear that game right here 1 o'clock later today. We'll come back. We'll tell you what else is on the air. We'll wrap it up next on Sports Daily.
All right, that's it for us. Uh, you have regular programming here for the next couple of hours, and then you'll get the Royals and Astros. Big one, 1 o'clock. Brady Singer takes the mound against Houston, try to push it to a seven-game win streak. That comes today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Lots of fun uh, to have on the program today, so make sure you tune in. At that point, we appreciate Tim Fitzgerald for jumping on the show uh, and helping us with the Kentucky Scott Drew, how it pertains to K-State situation. We'll keep our eye on that as well. We'll have it all for you tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening in. Thanks for watching on our video stream. We'll be back tomorrow, everybody. For Tommy Castor and Max Power, I'm Jake Balbrock. See you then.